But is there any part of you that that just ever wonders what that story would be if E.T. came back today? Well, well we're going, we don't need roads. Uh, Mr. Thomas, this is such a massive honor for me, sir. Seriously, thank you for taking the time. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to jump into this. Uh, I want to start out talking about one of just the single greatest sequences in the history of film, which is you riding the bike with E.T. and flying in front of the moon, one of the most iconic shots of all time. I'm sort of curious, what details do you remember about shooting that sequence and what, what that was like for you as a kid? Well, shooting it wasn't very exciting, I, I have to say. It was, you know... a a studio with some blue screens uh, and a couple of grips and a crane arm and a bike uh, and reacting to stuff that's being sh shouted to you from behind the camera. But when I saw it for the first time, uh, it was great because I had one of those moments where I was like, oh, that's what we were doing. I get it now. <laughs> Have you ever ridden the ride at, at was it at Universal? And, yeah. And, and it, I, was the ride a better experience than it was on set? The ride was more exciting for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think a testament to, to the power of this movie is that Steven Spielberg kind of got us to fall in love with a puppet in a way. Like it's one of the most incredible puppet creations in movie history, even though E.T. technically wasn't real, even though it was E.T. was a puppet on set, what was your relationship with him? Like, was there any part of you as a kid that still loved him, even though you knew he wasn't real? Well, I, I mean, I was kind of, I was beyond the the age of, you know, fantasy and reality blurring together. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I knew what we were making was uh, was dependent upon having a relationship, making this this puppet real. Right. So uh, a lot of my performance was, uh, you know, based on on him being real. And so he was real to me while the cameras were rolling. But uh, he was real to Drew all the time, most of the time. Uh, she would wrap scarves around his neck and worried about him being cold on the stage and things like that. Where would he where was he going to have his lunch? Um, you know, so so for Drew, we kind of kept that illusion alive and we played it up a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and that actually, I think, helped make him a little bit more real for the rest of us. I love that. Um, you know, with, with the HBO documentary um, about Steven Spielberg that came out a few years back, which was fantastic, and now The Fablemans, I feel like we're learning a lot about um, Steven's childhood and how that childhood kind of impacted his films, particularly early in his career. I'm sort of curious, as you've learned more about who Steven is as a man, does it change how you look at his films, particularly E.T., at least give you a different understanding of them? Well, I think when you look at where he was in his career when he made E.T., and the fact that he was only in his early 30s when, when he made that film, um, and coming off the success of Jaws and Close Encounters and Raiders of the Lost Ark, but also the failures of 1941 and used cars. And, you know, he was kind of in an interesting place in his career. And, and E.T. in a lot of ways was kind of a dark horse mm -hmm. uh, for him. So that's, that's really interesting, um, you know, in retrospect to look at it through that lens, uh, because I think he was pretty brave to make a film like E.T. at that juncture in his career. Um, you know, we've been getting so many legacy sequels lately, the biggest one, of course, being Top Gun, just such a uh, perfectly how it came together. Um, a question you've been asked for probably for 40 years, <laughs> any part of you that wants to see E.T. return to Elliot when he's grown with kids and see how he would handle I know we got the commercial, but is there any part of you that that just ever wonders what that story would be if E.T. came back today? Well, yes. I mean, but to be honest, it's my my primary interest would be in the residual checks. Um, <laughs> but uh, because I don't know where you would go with that, you know? I mean, they meet, they have a drink, 
They go home. Uh, I don't know. I, I'd, I'd still, I'm not gonna lie. I'd still watch that movie to be honest. I, mean, I, t- I think a yeah. lot of people would. That's <laughs> yeah. why my my residual check comment. Absolutely. But, but besides that, I don't really know. And it's also just it's such a perfect um, standalone story. I feel like to touch it would would tarnish it. Fair enough. Um, John Williams' score for E.T. affects me more than most pieces of music on this planet. I'm sort of curious, 40 years later, what does that score do for you? Does it affect you the way it affects us, or does being so close to the film change what you hear when you hear it? No, I mean, it, it's it's really a co-star of the film, the the score. You know, It's right up there with E.T. and Elliot. Uh, it 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 kind of uh, it it drives the whole piece really. So yeah, I mean, I think it's a beautiful score. When we saw the 20th anniversary, uh, John Williams conducted the orchestra live with the with the film, and that was amazing. Oh, it's beautiful. I saw the Chicago Symphony Orchestra uh, do it here a couple of a uh, couple of years back. Yeah, and, and it's just it's just it's unbelievable whenever you see whenever you see that. It's a um, wonderful thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm going to cut you loose on this. Uh, I want to talk about the the first time you showed the film to your kids and, and specifically how much forethought went into it. Like, did you put a lot of consideration into when you were going to do it, how you were going to do it, what the circumstances were going to be? Or was it just sort of a like, hey, I'm going to pop this movie on one day? No, I, I put way too much thought into it. And then it, it it totally backfired and disappointed me because I didn't know, but they had seen a trailer for ET like on a loop uh, because it was on, it was at the head of one of their other DVDs that they watched all the time. So I thought it was surprising them with the fact that I was the kid in ET and they said, we know that dad. And then it was all downhill from there. (laughs) Well, as we wrap up, I just want to thank you for just a lifetime of happiness and for giving me uh, my, my first great insult to get in trouble for at school, which was of course penis breath. Ooh, uh, yeah. I mean, that was that, that was that was a, that was a note that went home that I had to explain to the folks. But it was 100 percent worth it because now look look the fact that I get to talk to you makes it makes it all all the better. All um, full circle now. Yeah, exactly, Mr. Thomas. I I'm just such a fan, sir. And your work with Mike Flanagan, it's just absolutely genius. And and your scene in Doctor Sleep, if you don't mind me, is I think one of my favorite moments in horror movie history. That movie's a masterpiece. Oh. So, well, thank you so much. It's yeah. a pleasure. And, and thanks for being a fan. And yeah. thanks for talking to me. Thank you for your time. Appreciate you. Thank you. Bye-bye. We're going, we don't need roads.